Septim differs from Matthew and Mark's, I write to Gentiles. So Jewish customs and practices, laws and procedures must be explained. Rather than retell what I've already told you in the gospel, I've provided background information used to write the gospel. My research led me to many people who are part of this story. I shared with you the beginning, well, of Jesus' human life, since God has no beginning, he's the promised one, foretold back in the beginning of all man. We all need a savior because we've disobe disobeyed God's commandments. The Jews had been anticipating their Messiah since the beginning of time. When God promised in Eden he would send someone to crush the head of the serpent. I've shared how Elijah, the forerunner, came announcing his coming. John the baptizer was that forerunner. His life was snuffed out by Herod because John told Herod that he too too was a sinner needing a savior. I spent much time in Ephesus listening to Mary, the mother of Jesus, but she and her nephew John were such a wealth of information. I must linger here for a while longer. John, after all, was one of Jesus' disciples. And again, have I have forgotten to introduce to properly introduce myself. I am Luke commonly known as the physician. And now, without any more introduction, let me begin. I left the narrative just after his birth. Mary told of their visit to the temple and how Simeon prophesied that a sword would pierce her heart. Now the story continues from Mary's perspective and John's inserts. Mary sighed as she continued. Of course, we went every year to fulfill the law and celebrate Passover. Jerusalem was always crowded during this time. Everyone came. We remained with our caravan outside the city walls for the most part, but we had to present our lamb for sacrifice to the priests. Jesus could hardly wait to go to the temple. He asked many questions about it. I was relieved. Jesus, Joseph patiently answered the questions. I, I felt stressed, trying to keep the children with me so we wouldn't lose them, especially as Roman officials galloped their horses through the streets, not caring who they trampled over. Joseph held the lamb, which wasn't cooperative either, just maneuvering the clouds, all those people bumping and jostling us. She shook her head. It wasn't something I enjoyed. The crowds filled the streets. The heat heightened the smells, noise, and flies. When our turn came to present our lamb, there were rows of priests. We took our place in front of one. When the priest in front of us received the basin from the one beside him, Joseph would slit the lamb's neck while the priest caught the blood. He would then pass the basin to the next priest for their blood. During this time, the priest sang. I was relieved that they sang. Their singing would muffle the lamb's last plead, for which I was thankful. When a basin became full, it was poured over the sin altar in the common courtyard of the people. The altar would soon be covered in blood with more drop being tripping down the sides. The blood was a messy business. Flies were everywhere. Once completed, Joseph swung the lamb on his shoulders to carry it back to our tent where the Passover would be completed. You can now see why the temple and streets were so crowded. All Jews must come to the temple. As we left after presenting our lamb, Jesus was not with us. I found him staring at the altar. I cannot describe his expression, for it had a mixture of deep sadness, pain, and resolution. When I called him, he joined us, reluctantly. I wondered at his expression and asked him, What were you thinking? His response showed great foresight. Do people realize the sacrifice it must take to be acceptable to God? I looked back at the blood dripping on that altar and shook my head. Now looking back in time to what he did for me, Mary shook her head. We can never realize what God sacrificed to make us acceptable in his sight. After Passover, we packed up our belongings, our donkey and wagon quite loaded. The excitement of the festivities worn off. 
I was tired. Our caravan started for home. Such a relief to be getting away from all the people I could breathe. Keeping with the caravan, especially with little ones, takes all I could do. I must keep the coals warm enough to start the fire for cooking at night. We constantly looked for fuel, especially with so many people traveling. Nothing was available. I sent the children to gather branches and dung as we walked, collecting enough for the evening and the next morning meal. We traveled a day before Joseph and I realized Jesus was not with us. I was frantic. How could I have been so busy with things not to notice and missing? Joseph comforted me, but he too felt responsible. We pulled out of the caravan and returned to the city. Where in the big city of Jerusalem would a 12-year-old boy go? We had gone to the city markets for supplies, but now searching the streets and markets left me more in a frenzy. Where could he be? Joseph suggested the temple. Then I remembered all his questions and how he stayed at the altar. We ran to the temple. I stumbled up the stairs, not so crowded now. Joseph grabbed my arm and held me briefly. He whispered, God knows where he is. We will find him. His calmness making me slow down, at least on the outside. But my mind was still racing over what an awful parent I was. Several rulers stood in the courtyard. Joseph approached one and asked if he had seen a child of twelve. Not your normal question to bother a ruler about. He smiled and led us down a long hallway. We followed. I felt hope for the first time. Our feet echoed on the granite hallway. My breathing slowed. He paused before a huge door, pushed it open, and gestured for us to enter before him. Pharisees, Sadducees, scribes all sat around a long table. My eyes followed the table to the end where Jesus stood. He was asking a question. Joseph told me later, for I was too distraught to notice. All those important men were listening intently to his question. In spite of the formality, I ran and crushed him in a hug. Son, why have you treated us so? We've been searching for you. His answer frustrated me. But later, as I considered it, it amazed me. Why were you looking for me? Didn't you know I must be in my father's house? Luke interjected, I wonder if any rulers remembered this when he started his ministry. John agreed. He left, he left no doubt by what he said. Luke nodded, and interestingly, sorry, but go on. Mary drank briefly, then continued, as we left the room, those rulers stood. I was too frazzled to realize it then, but later Joseph pointed it out. When we asked Jesus, what did you talk about? Jesus shrugged. How can sin only be outward when our thoughts control what we do? And how can God be only our God when he created everyone? And why must the sacrifice for sin be blood? Question similar to what he had been asking Joseph and the scribes who taught the boys the law in our small village of Nazareth. Joseph had asked, so how did the rulers answer? Jesus shrugged. They said something about the law must be for outward actions so people can be controlled, but they didn't really answer my other questions. Luke laughed. No wonder they stood when he left. Mary joined me in laughing, relieved Joseph Relieved, Joseph, he had been trying to answer those kind of questions all of Jesus' life. She told of other childhood <coughs> incidents that only a mother would remember. How he learned carpentry, how comforting he was when Joseph died, and how he led his brothers in the business. Then she told how he was baptized by John the baptizer. Mary described, when John brought Jesus out of the water, I heard God speak from the sky. This is my beloved son. Obey him. Others heard only a rumbling in a sky so bright without clouds that alone should have caused them to wonder. After such a magnificent statement from God, he went into the wilderness. As a mother, it's hard to let go of our sons, but God instructed from the beginning a son must leave his mother when he marries. Though Jesus never married, he still had to leave me. Of course, it wasn't all at once, but a process, like the wedding of my cousin in Cana. 
I tried to instruct him when they ran out of wine, but he firmly told me his time wasn't ready. So after he was baptized, when he went off by himself into the wilderness, I had to let him go. He didn't explain himself, though I wanted to know. Jesus returned to Nazareth. He read the scriptures in the synagogue and told how they were fulfilled that day. Most did not believe. A reaction I had ex experienced many times, especially with Jesus' father. It should have prepared me for what was coming. But I was looking for deliverance from this world's problem, not a companion through them. Our people, especially the rulers, did not believe. They saw him as only Joseph's son. Jesus responded to the ruler's opposition, recounting how Elisha healed Naaman, the Syrian, from his leprosy. Not the countless Israelites who were lepers. And when famine came to our land, Elijah was sent to a widow in Sudan, not to his own. Nor would any prophet be accepted by his own people. And this made them furious. I feared for his life. And he chose his disciples. I wondered why he chose some of them. Mary shrugged and smiled. But I was learning to keep my mouth shut and watch. When does a son ever outgrow his mother's advice, even if that son is God? He laughed with her. At this point, Mary gestured to John. You'd be better at retelling how Jesus chose his disciples. John cleared his throat. His eyes shone with enthusiasm. We'd been fishing all night. James and I partnered with Simon. We sat in our boats, mending our nets, though we'd caught nothing during the night. The master came walking along the beach. When he came to Simon's boat, he got in and asked Simon to go out from the beach. Then he spoke. People gathered to listen. When he finished, he told Simon to put the boat into deep waters and let down his nets. Simon told him, this time wasn't the best time to fish. Even last time, night we caught nothing, but at your word, I'll let down the nets. As soon as he lowered his nets, they were filled. He called us to help. We filled both boats, more than what we could hold, for the boat started to sink. Peter fell at Jesus' feet. Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. I looked at James's face. His face, though darkened by the sun, was pale, his eyes wide. I couldn't imagine mine being any different. Who was this man who told fish what to do? But Jesus said, Don't be afraid. From now on, you'll be catching men. We landed our boats and followed him. And we witnessed such miracles. Luke nodded. I'm not sure how I will select which miracles to write about. John added, there were so many. I tilted my head and thought, if my emphasis is to explain Jewish things to the Gentiles, I must show why the rulers and scribes hated him enough to kill him. John laughed. There were plenty of times they questioned to test him. He often criticized what they did and who they were. I leaned forward. Yes, those are the times I must hear about. So John continued as I wrote furiously. Enthralled by the way their hatred for him grew. If the reader is curious, read my account with that perspective in mind. It will make the time he allowed himself to be taken all the more significant. John settled back against the wall. They were they were always there when Jesus spoke to the crowds, if not one of them, a representative for them. It was as though he drew them, just like the crowds, and he was up for any test they gave him. I paused in my excitement, for I did enjoy a challenge. What did you do, Mary, during these times? Mary laughed. I followed him when I could. Sometimes he led the disciples apart from the crowds, even from me. She smiled and shrugged. My task was over, though hard for me to not be included. How did you feel as he scolded your rulers? John laughed. He did more than scold. They were long past needing it. Our people knew it, but were powerless to do anything. We must obey the law, bringing our sacrifices and money to the temple. Though we knew they didn't use it well, many were glad to hear the rulers question. 
questioned. But the master's miracles and words were why people came. We knew he was from God and was our Messiah, though we could never have understood what that really meant until his spirit came. So much of what he said we didn't understand until later. John gestured to Mary, but I didn't answer for you. Mary smiled. Though our rulers needed their rebuke, I cringed, not wanting Jesus to be hurt by them. For they did have power, and they would use it, and we later saw. They continued through the day, sharing Jesus' miracles and teachings. When we approached the end of his life, I could, I could feel their enthusiasm lessening and a hesitancy to share. John shot side. There were so many times he'd predict what was going to happen, like the Passover. The master told Peter and I to prepare it. When we asked where, he informed, Enter the city where a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Isn't that a miracle in itself? Yet we didn't question him, for we had been with him for three years. Luke laughed. What did you do then? John smiled and shrugged. The master said, Follow him and tell the master of the house. The teacher says to you, Where is the guest room and where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? And he will show you a room and there make ready. And it happened, just as he said. Perhaps we'd gotten used to him telling us the future, that we expected it without surprise. But he told much of his coming, of his coming suffering, and that we could not believe, and that we could not believe. Maybe we did not want to believe it. At the Passover, Jesus served by washing our feet while we argued over who would be greatest. How could we have been so clueless? John shook his head. Jesus instructed, I sent you out before without money or extra cloak, but now take a cloak or even sell your cloak to buy a sword. Peter found two in the room and showed it to the master. He said, it is enough. Should have made us wonder why. We had so much to learn. Not that we didn't know our history, but our history all pointed to him. Even Passover, he presented with new meaning, his blood and his body, yet we didn't understand. Would we have done any different? John shrugged. When he prayed at the Mount of Olives, he went a stone's throw from us and fell to the ground. In agony, he cried, Father, if you, are, if you are willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. I was alarmed. I never heard him pray with such intensity. I felt the master's heaviness, as we all did. It brought a subdued sorrow to us. Coupled with the lateness of the evening, I must have dozed. For when I woke, though the night was dark, a light circled the master. A second person, an angel, ministered to him. John sighed disgustingly, for we certainly did not, nor did we pray. Instead, I slept. John shook his head. When he woke us, he asked, Why are you sleeping? Rise and pray. You enter not into temptation. Soon after, the soldiers came. Judas led them. Why would they be here? And why was Judas with them? When Judas stopped before Jesus and kissed him, Jesus said, Judas, would you betray the Son of Man with a kiss? But I could not believe it. Not Judas. Not like this. Jesus had even told us. Why was I surprised? But the night was full of surprises. Things Jesus told us would happen, but we were too busy wondering who would be the greatest in his kingdom. Again, John shook his head. Peter waved his sword, cutting the high priest's servant's ear off. Jesus healed the servant and told Peter, No more of this. He protected us, even as he was being taken. Peter tucked his sword away. At least he had tried to protect Jesus. I just stood, watching. Then Jesus addressed the chief priests and officers, have you come against a robber with swords and clubs? When I was with you day after day in the temple, you didn't lay hands on me. But this is your hour, the power of darkness. 
I couldn't imagine what power darkness held, but I would soon know. They bound and led him away like an animal. I followed from a distance. They took him to the high priests. They admitted me inside his outer courtyard. I was known there by his servants for bringing him his fish. Peter came to the gate, but wasn't allowed inside. I spoke to one of the servant girls who went to the gate. Aren't you one of this man's disciples? Peter shook his head. I don't know him. I cringed. I was trying to allow him to enter, to be with the master. The girl glanced at me and shrugged. I nodded. She motioned him through the gate. He did not stand with me. The night had grown cold. No moon. My thoughts whirled. The master waited outside the courtroom, commonly used for beatings that the court would demand. While waiting, the soldiers taunted him, blindfolding, then beating him and asking, Who hit you? Their mockery made me sick. I could not watch, but heard his gasps of pain when they struck him. Each strike made me wince. In the midst of this, another man approached Peter, asking if he was one of his. He declared no. The cousin of Malchus, the high priest's servant, whose ears had been cut off, heard and approached Peter. Weren't you in the garden with him? It had been dark in the garden, only their torches giving light. Peter swore his denial. A rooster crowed. The master looked at Peter. Peter's shoulders slumped. He stumbled from the courtyard. I caught a glimpse of his face as he left. Tears were already forming in his eyes. In his fear, Peter denied him. I understood that fear. Most knew me for the fish I brought, not for the disciple I was. But I did nothing. Yet no man could stop the evil that continued that night. Caiaphas, the high priest, came from his house to enter the room where court was held. They took the master into the room, so after... Annas, the former high priest, was escorted to the courtroom. Court what a strange activity. We'll have a brief intermission for a song. I had been so exhausted earlier when I'd slept in the garden, when I could have prayed, but now I couldn't sleep. What was going on here? 
All those times when the rulers tried to push the master over a cliff or stone him, surely now would be like one of those times. He would escape their hold. Yet his resignation to be taken seemed to mark a different outcome. The master's prayer, its intensity and anguish, was this what he was anticipating? My fear grew as I warmed my hands before the fire. I strained my ears to hear through the walls. I could not. But my thoughts led me many places that night. None were as bad as the hyenas acts that acts which that would be actually be done to him. Soon I recognized the rulers of the Sanhedrin hurrying through the courtyard to the judgment room. Some talking enthusiastically. They couldn't be holding court tonight. The law forbid trial at night and not during a feast. The accused was supposed to be given counsel or someone to represent him. Would I be asked? I cringed. What would I say? I already found excuses for why I couldn't. The courtroom door finally opened. They poured into the courtyard, taking the master with them. They shook their heads, their voices raising over the quietness of the courtyard. He says he's the Son of God, I wanted to say, because he is the Son of God. But my tongue stuck to my mouth and my lips wouldn't open. The courtyard was now empty and quiet. I could do nothing here. Not that I could do anything anywhere. I felt alone, helpless, scared, and hopeless. What would happen to the master? I pushed the gate open and stumbled across the street. The street was empty from the crowds of, of the day. All Jews would be staying in their homes as required by the Passover, or should be, as I thought about the Sahedrin. I could not return to where he had Passover. The master would not be there. Was it too late to go back to the garden and pray? But the garden would hold too many accusations of how I did nothing. I did not think, I just walked. Questions circled my mind. What would they do to the master? I seethed. He had done nothing wrong, yet I feared. If they did this to him, what would they do to his followers? I was confused. Wasn't he our Messiah? I remembered the miracles, affirmations, prophecies, all pointing to him. How could he not be the Messiah? So many questions, all of them unanswered. I saw none of the other disciples. They had vanished. Frightened like me, I walked all night. The sun's light finally pierced through the dim, so dark, black night. I only registered that when I didn't trip over the cobblestone street. Interrupting my tumbled thoughts, I heard jeering and heckling. Normally, I avoided this street. It supported the Romans, their justice, their authority. But my steps took me there. Curiosity didn't draw me. Dread did. My heart felt a foreboding my mind could not grasp. A crowd had gathered. The street was Via Della Rosa, the street that led to the crucifixions. I pushed my way so I could see. One man led the procession, struggling to carry his 300-pound cross. Jeering and heckling followed him. He threw it back to the crowd, inciting more. Another man followed. He seemed to feel his shame and remain quiet, though the crowd still spat and taunted him. Roman soldiers parted the crowd for a third man. My heart stopped. It could not be. The man's head held a crown of thorns, two inches long, crammed into his skin. From each thorn piercing, a revelet of blood had poured from brow to blind him. His beard had been ripped from his face. He passed me. Blood covering covered his body where chunks of skin had been pulled from his back and chest. Bruising had already started. A group of women cried, cried loudly. The man stopped. Daughters of Jerusalem. That voice. It was. My master. I could not recognize him. The man who healed people, gave sight to the blind, healed the deaf, made the lame walk. My master. My leaders did this to him. I was angry. How could they? But then my anger turned inward. What, I, what had I done to stop this? Nothing. Absolutely nothing. 
The master continued, Do not weep for me, but weep for yourselves and for your children. Days are coming when they will say, Blessed are the barren and the breasts that never nursed. Then they will say to the mountains, Fall on us, and to the hills, cover us. For if they do these things when the wood is green, what will happen when it is dry? The soldiers poked him with a lance to keep him going. The weight of the cross tore him to his back, where blood that had congealed now poured again. I pushed my way to follow him, Master. But the crowd pushed me aside. He saved others. Let himself save him. Let him save himself. He stumbled and fell several times before a soldier grabbed someone from the crowd to carry his cross. Still he walked, staggering. I was carried by the crowds as they moved to the place of the skull, a knoll at the base of the mountain where everyone had entered or left Jerusalem must pass. Here they brought our master, perfect, sinless, and innocent. They pounded the spikes in his wrists and feet. The sound echoed over the rocks. His entire body jerked against the blows. His back wounds reopened. More blood flowed, changing the wood to crimson. When the soldiers raised that cross and dropped it into the hole, his body jolted as it slammed against the splintered wood. When he caught his breath, he said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. I wanted to scream, they do, they do. Kill them instead. I could not watch each breath a struggle. The crowds were not all the jeering ones. There was the man who healed, who was healed by the pool. He had taken up his bed and walked, first time in 35 years, on the Sabbath. He had walked here today to see the master. There was a woman who touched the hem of his garment and was healed. There were so many healed by his touch or word, they watched in silence, quiet, disbelief, loss, sorrow. But wasn't he the Messiah? I saw a familiar group, the woman who followed the master throughout his ministry, with them, my Aunt Mary. I walked to her, and she clung to me, and sobbed, and sobbed, and sobbed. John looked at her now. I finally registered you were talking to me. Remember what you said? Mary nodded. This is the sword that would pierce my heart. Luke nodded. From Simeon's prophecy, when you went to the temple at his birth, Mary explained, right. I thought many times it had already done so, but this was the sword. I cried to will his every breath. I tried to will his every breath. John continued, One criminal railed at him, Are you not the Christ? Save yourselves and us. But the other rebuked him, Don't you fear God? Since you are under the same sentence of condemnation, we justly, for we deserve this for our actions. But this man has done nothing wrong. And he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. The master said, Today, you will be with me in paradise. John paused. We watched our Messiah die before our eyes. I cannot tell you what went through my mind. Hopelessness, fear, loss. He was our Messiah. John shook his head. The master looked at me. Behold your mother. I felt the honor of her care. This one thing I could do for my master. I felt unworthy, but it was all that I could do. Mary patted his arm. You've been a good son to me. John swallowed and resumed his narrative. At noonday, the sky turned black, and not like a rain cloud, but like the sun stopped shining. It stayed black for three hours. Mary shook her head. I could no longer watch him, but still heard him struggle for each breath, his gasps so heart-wrenching to hear. I prayed God would take him. Don't let him suffer anymore. It was then he spoke. Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Even in his dying, he showed compassion for me to be ready. Though how can any mother be ready for her son to die? 
John added, The centurion had watched his man gamble over his clothes. How trivial Rome made of human life. Then hearing the exchange between those on the crosses, he shook his head and looked at the master. Certainly this man was innocent. When the soldiers removed his body from the cross, a man stepped forward to take the body. I didn't stay to follow where he put the body. I took Mary to our family's tent. Mary interjected, You had already been up all the previous day and night, and that day you were exhausted. I know you. I know I was. Luke added, Grief doesn't allow us to think clearly. John nodded. Everything felt numb. The Passover seemed like decades ago, though it was only a day past. Somehow we managed to celebrate the Sabbath. Going through the motions, everything reminded me of Jesus. Mary took up the story. Once the Sabbath was over, in the early dawn, some women arrived in our tent. We gathered oils to care for the body. My anguish, still raw, I hadn't considered his body until this moment. How do we know where the body is? One of the women, Joanna, hugged me. We followed after his death. Come with us. I couldn't think clearly, but my sister, your mother. Mary looked at John, then me. Salem's her name, but she went by Mary. Encouraged me to go. As we walked, Joanna spoke out loud. How will we move the rock? Salome asked, what rock? Joanna responded, Almost as soon as the body was placed in the tomb, the Romans sealed it. They hurried the body preparation. It seems they thought we'd steal the body. Salome exploded. So the Romans would take even our freedom to prepare the body from us. Joanna added, that was probably under our own leader's instance. insistence. They instigated all of this. I know about it from my husband. At this point, Luke interrupted, who was her husband? Mary explained, he was the chief steward in Herod's palace. Joanna had been healed of evil spirits by the master and had followed him most of his ministry, supporting him. Mary resumed the dialogue. Joanna told, our rulers came with Jesus when he was tried by Herod. Herod questioned him for a long time trying to make him perform a sign for him. All the while, our scribes and leaders accused him, telling how he claimed to be a king and wouldn't pay tribute. So Herod and his soldiers mocked him, put a purple robe and that crown of thorns on him, it seemed to put Herod in a good mood. Anytime Herod's in a good mood, watch out. Someone will soon be dead. That's how I knew to come to see what was happening. Siloam interrupted, but how will we move the stone? Everyone remained silent. As we approached the grave, someone asked, Whose grave is this? For it had to be from someone wealthy. Joanna answered again, It's Joseph from Ar Arimathea. He was a member of the council. He seemed good and righteous, not consenting to any of their actions. He asked Pilate for the master's body. He hurried, for he knew the Sabbath was beginning. Luke interrupted again, why would this that matter? Mary answered, he'd be unclean and unable to celebrate Sabbath if he touched a dead person. Luke nodded. She resumed her account. I think it was Salem who said it was wonderful for him to give his own grave and ask for the body. No one said anything. But everyone thought they hadn't claimed his body. By association, the leaders would know us as his disciples. I again interrupted, what happened to Joseph as part of the council? John inserted, he'd be excommunicated. Not only would he lose his position, he'd no longer be permitted in the temple, nor would Jews do business with him. I nodded, it's a heavy price to pay for claiming a dead person. Sorry, Mary, go on. She continued, as we arrived, I think Joanna noticed first, someone has moved the stone, and others suggested, I hope they haven't stolen his body. 
By the time we reached the cave opening, I was breathless. I paused to catch my breath, not sure I was ready to see his lifeless form. Others burst inside, wanting to make sure things were as they should be. Where's the body? Anger boiled within me. Not only would the religious leaders kill my son, but they would take his body too. Angry tears cursed down my face. But Joanna pointed. No one stole the body. Look, the form of his body still lies in the grave clothes. I haven't seen the gra I hadn't seen the grave clothes, but I was still angry and took it out on her. He is dead. Didn't you see him on the cross? No man could live through that. Joanna responded, I didn't I don't deny his death, Mary. I just say, this isn't his body. I breathed deeply, wiped my face with my hood, and looked carefully. Joanna interrupted, even the face cloth is folded nicely. What can this mean? I took the face, face cloth, held it against my heart, my tears starting again. My confusion hurt, all very raw. No one said any more. As we pondered, two men appeared. Their appearance filled the dark cave with light. We dropped to our knees and bowed to the ground. One of the men spoke, Why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here, but he is risen. Remember how he told you while he was still in Galilee, the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified on the third day. Rise. Before we could process what they said, they vanished. The cave grew dark again. Once my eyes grew accustomed to the darkness, I remember standing on shaky legs and staring at the grave clothes. They lay flat with no body. My mind was slow to comprehend their words. All the women were quiet. Joanna was the first to find her voice. She whispered with great awe. Great is our Lord and greatly to be praised. Evil could not keep him down. He is alive. I wasn't so quick to grasp, my heart so broken over watching my son slowly die before my eyes. Could my son and Savior be alive? It seemed too great to think. I touched the grave clothes. There was no life here, nothing inside, no body. The other women took up Joanna's praise. Joanna hugged me. He is alive. How can a heart go from utterly stabbed into a million pieces to wonder in great praise in one thought? Only God can do that. Yet I was hesitant to believe. Like a dream I would waken to find was all wrong. I didn't want to believe because of the pain that it might bring when I found it really wasn't so. But the woman's praise was contagious, and this was no dream. I smiled and danced, giddy with laughter and praise. Salome asked, what should we do? Joanna asked, again, was the first to speak. Tell his disciples. And we did. John nodded. After hearing the women's message and verifying the empty tomb, we didn't know where to go. We gathered in the upper room where we had the Passover. As we assembled, no one spoke. Peter, more subdued than I'd ever seen him, he would not even look me in the eye. But we all felt the, the shame. All kept our heads down and fidgeted. I had not slept much since the Passover, and I doubt any others did either. Judas was noticeably absent. One asked about him. I could feel anger boil within me. He did not deserve to be with us. If it hadn't been for him, Andrew coughed. It seems after the night, he coughed, for we all knew what night he referred to. After the night, Judas, he said it with anger, hung himself. There were grunts of assent. His end, tragic, did not seem enough. Silence came again. No one wanted to voice their thoughts. We huddled in quietness. Such uncertainty, fear, lostness. What should we do now? We kept the door locked. Then the master appeared. No door opened. He was just there. A spirit. The master spoke. 
Peace to you. Why are you troubled, and why do you doubt? See my hands and my feet. It is I. Touch me and see. For a spirit does not have flesh and bones, as I have. Of course, Peter approached and touched the master first, timidly, but then with assurance. I came next. His eyes held mine, and he smiled. I did not touch his wounded hands, but grabbed a hold of him and hugged him, and sobbed, sobbed like a baby. My master was alive and back. He laughed and held me tight. When the others finished greeting him, he sat. Have you anything to eat? We searched. Andrew found a broiled fish. The master chewed and swallowed. John laughed. We all watched as if to make sure he still was in a spirit. Then he said, These are my words. I spoke to you while I was still with you. Everything written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he explained the scriptures. Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead. Repentance and forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in my name to all nations beginning from Israel, beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. Behold, I'm sending the promise of my Father upon you. But stay in the city until you are clothed with power from on high. We listened during those days like we never heard before. As he told how the scriptures pointed to him, it was like his resurrection brought his instruction to life. He led us as far from the city as Bethany. While instructing and blessing us, he was taken into heaven. Gone. We watched him leave. This time we rejoiced and worshipped. Returning to Jerusalem, we stayed in the temple and blessed God. We gathered, perhaps with a little fear, but waiting for that power he promised, what would it be like? Would we know it when it came? Such wasted questions. When does God ever tell you to do something without equipping you? When the Spirit came upon us at Pentecost, we did not have any doubt nor wonder, just power to proclaim Jesus, our Master and Savior, had conquered sin, death, and evil, and was alive. Luke sat back and sighed, What a testimony of our wonderful Savior, of His love and compassion, of the truthfulness and integrity of His Word to fulfill all those prophecies of changed lives, of our great God, what more can we say but praise God? I must talk with Joseph of Arimathea. If he was with the council, he would have information about when Jesus stood before the high priest and Pilate. That insight would answer some of my questions. John nodded. He went into hiding, being excommunicated by our leaders, not sure where he might find him, if he's still alive. Luke added, I'd like to speak to Joanna, too. Mary shook her head. She's gone. She was one of the first killed. She was more outspoken than others. Luke sighed, and the persecution continues. But soon we shall all live with him, who conquered sin and death and stands at the right hand of the throne of God, and all glory will be given to him. John and Mary said together, Amen.
lot of goodies back there. I don't know if you guys are hungry. God, thank you for this story that was so well told by uh, Jacob and his mom who wrote it. And God, I pray that we'll remember this and be thankful for it. And thank you for the food you provide and this life you give and that we can live it to the full because of you. In Christ's name, amen. amen. Enjoy. You guys better go get some good, good food over there. I'm telling you, it's very good. Uh, this is my cousin Janice. Janice, good.